Hello, everyone, and welcome to Creative Live. Welcome back to Creative Live. I'm Kenna Klosterman, your host here, and I'm also the host of the podcast, We Are Photographers, where we take you into the lives of our favorite photographers, filmmakers, creative industry gates, wherever they are all over the world, from their homes to my home to yours. And so I want to invite you to participate and have a conversation today with the other folks who are joining in online, whether you are watching on Creative Live TV, there is a chat icon, you can click on that. Of course, we love to give the shout outs as to where in the world you are tuning in from. So please get those coming in. And if you are tuning in on Facebook, Renee's Facebook, welcome, 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 YouTube, Twitter. Uh, we love to see you all here. So once again, uh, we are recording and you are coming in live for uh, our podcast, We Are Photographers. And today I am so excited to feature my friend, Renee Robin. And Renee is a Canadian photographer and composite artist. Um, you know her work because her style is so unique that it is instantly recognizable. Um, she creates fantastical worlds, uh, blending both fact and fiction. Uh, she has worked with a number of clients who are drawn to that style, uh, whether that Sonic, Corel, Capture One, Intel, and many more. Um, she, of course, teaches all over the world as well, whether that's a speaker at conferences, right here on Creative Live, and many more. And I am just greatly looking forward to talking to Renee, not only about her work and her style, but the things that have influenced that. So going back to her childhood on a farm and all of her travels all over to the corners of the earth. So please help me welcome Renee Robin. Hello, how's it going? <laughs> it is good. It is so exciting to finally have you on, um, on the show. It's been a while now since I last saw you in person right before uh, everything broke out. Of course, we're, we're recording this um, in December of 2020. And so um, shout out to all of you out there. Hope you are doing well. Um, and before we start the conversation, uh, Renee, I want to give some shout outs because they are coming in. First of all, to Lisa Carney, who's tuning in and says, I love these two gals. Hi, Lisa. Uh, we have <laughs> Stefan, who is tuning in from South Africa, Toby in Canada, Karen in Arizona, um, and on and on, Phoenix, Germany. Yay. Love it. Okay. Renee, let's talk about you. Let's talk about <laughs> you and your life. Um, Sounds good. I know that you uh, travel a lot historically. Um, <laughs> yeah, a, 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 yeah, a big part of, of your world and creating worlds and influences. Um, so you were just got to spend some time in Newfoundland. And I want to know, starting with that, like what does being in such magical places um, uh, what draws you to places such as that, that are remote, are gale force winds, as you talk about, um, <laughs> what does that being in that environment do for you and your work? Uh, I mean, the biggest thing that I love about those places is that I like seeing them in conditions that most people don't want to be out there for, right? So, I mean, when I want to shoot back plates, the last thing I want is a bunch of tourists or other people in the shots. So I tend to go out in like the crappiest weather. <laughs> so <clears throat> if it's pouring rain or if it's like sideways wind and hail and stuff, like I am totally there, you know, and, and I love that environment. I mean, my favorite season of the year in Alberta anyways is storm season. And, you know, because we get such amazing storms here and everyone talks about when they come to Alberta, the Alberta skies. And that is my favorite part about Alberta. And so I kind of chase that wild weather wherever I'm traveling. And um, I just like it. I just like how it feels. I love feeling like the reminder that nature just doesn't care. <laughs> I really appreciate that. <laughs> well, I, I and so take that a little bit further, because I did want to, because obviously you're drawn to um, something that does have a, an emotion to it. It's not just your standard sunny day. Yeah. Uh, and and so uh, take, take us a little bit further into, is it the, the drama of it? Is it the, again, feeling small? Not small, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I think I just I just love the personality of inclement weather. I mean, within reason, obviously. Um, <laughs> but I love the way that the ocean, uh, the the personality that the water gets in a storm. I love the way the clouds look in storms. I love the way that you know the the plants and the snow and everything just gets like a little bit more harsh, a little bit more turned up and. I just, I just like aesthetically appeals to me. I mean, I don't like being cold. I don't like being wet. I'm always cold. <laughs> Even in summer, I always bring a hoodie with me unless I'm in like California or something or God forbid, Arizona in the summer. But, <laughs> but I mean, most of the time I just like, I love the way that it looks. I mean, even some of my favorite photographs that I got uh, this last year before everything was shut down, I was in, uh, Death Valley and in Red Rocks and this storm blew through and it's some of my favorite photographs I have of theirs you know the way that the the atmospheric depth stacks up and you can really feel how far away something is right where you know and a lot of times in photography well, people are trying to you know remove that and make it a little bit more flat and get rid of the atmospheric depth whereas in compositing we want to we want to show that so even when it comes to photographing landscapes which I'm not really I just like shooting landscapes <laughs> Um, you know, those pieces, when I build them into the composite, having the pre-existing atmospheric depth is, is handy. And I just, I just love the way it looks. <laughs> well, I mean, and that's creating the scene or that's creating the, the, like you said, capturing those backdrops. Yeah. When you are, um, in your composites, when you are creating these worlds, does it start in your mind from that backdrop or is there, it, it, is and then are you seeking that out or does the backdrop then kind of uh, point of, you towards what you're going to create all of the above all of the above so and sometimes I'll be at a location and I'll be photographing it and it's the location that's like oh my god if we just had a b c d and e this would be an amazing shot and then other times it'll be I mean this uh I worked with a model last year and she's this her name is Dane and she's this tall redhead you know like 5'11 and we'd been wanting to work together for years. And we were just like, what should we do? And she's a, she's a glamour, a boudoir glamour model kind of, you know, that kind of shot. And I was like, man, just looking at her in person totally changed what I wanted to shoot with her. And I was like, man, what if we do like something like Boudica inspired, you know, like we do like heavy draping of fabrics and very little makeup and kind of a little bit dirty and grungy and stuff. And so like her, you know, just her natural, you know, build was, what inspired some of my favorite images. And so it's kind of funny how it rotates like that. It, it can be all of the things. I mean, I can even be in a fabric store and see like a little bit of fabric and I'm like, oh, I could turn this into something because I'm, I'm learning how to sew and I'm not very good, <laughs> but I'm learning. And you know, it can be just that little piece of fabric and be like, oh, I can turn this into all these things. And then it starts like the pot starts boiling, right? So I'm constantly have like a thousand different pots bubbling in the background and waiting for more ingredients and then finally when it's finished being cooked I can eat it <laughs> brilliantly said uh, <laughs> because I've first of all I shared one of those images this morning on my oh, yeah that's on, right yeah that's, that's because, one of them yeah yeah because I just I love the the world that's created and and yes with her as this you know as representing you know what what have you and I've I'm I'm curious, I love you talking about, well, first of all, learning to sew, but also just the the learning process, because I've heard you talk about um, that when you, whether it's, I mean, you're a master in compositing and so, and, and creating. <laughs> uh, and, and so to have learned all of that and not just to learn it, but then be able to teach it as well um, is not just a casual thing. So how do you approach learning for yourself, um, even if it's something like sewing? I try to start off small and easy, but I rarely do. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm constantly reminded that the fundamentals are so important. If you don't understand the fundamentals, you know, the higher up you climb in your creative career, that that fundamental balance gets a little bit wobbly. And I notice that now with the type of artwork that I want to create, I wish 10 or 12 years ago, I'd had some formal training in fine arts because that foundation I'm starting to notice is getting a little bit wobbly. It took a few years, 
but now all these skills up here are being held back by like a little fundamental gap. And so I kind of notice the wobblies. I'm having to go back and learn, you know, these fundamental, you know, composition for film, for example. Um, my cat's got the zoomies. I apologize if you hear a crash. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, D Dino was Dino was wondering um, in on Facebook where the cat was. So there you go, Dino. <laughs> yeah, she just ran and fell off the edge of the couch. So <laughs> in like true form. <laughs> and so, so, so going back to the fine art, because I know I've also heard you say that like photography isn't the thing that inspires you per se. That it, it is more about, um, again, creating those worlds and, and creating something. Um, and yeah, that cinematic look, the, the going historical, um, fantasy. So what is it about the fine arts that you are trying to or realize that was a missing piece? Um, I mean, just the, the, the further I try to push the images that I want to make, you know, because no matter what we do, and this, I think it's, it's pretty universal for anybody who's creative. There's your, there's your taste and then there's your skill. And the further along you get, like your taste and skill are always this far apart, right? Like they never really get much closer. I mean, for some people, maybe they do, but for me, that's, it's always been the same distance of just out of reach. And so that's kind of what it feels like is, is it's like this you know, I'm constantly reaching for more. So the better I get as an artist, the more I start to realize my taste evolves. And I'm like, oh, this suddenly makes sense. Like, oh, that's why that, that you know, these puzzle pieces that start falling into place that, that, you know, it was a part of the puzzle that I didn't even know existed that I'm starting, you know, the more you know, the more you know, you don't know, right? Um, so there's like, it like expands, right? <laughs> That's literally what I was gonna about to say was yeah, yeah. exactly like yeah. you don't know you don't know what you don't know. A hundred percent. That's exactly it. So I want to go back in time then a little bit uh, because you started your career very early on and um, you were a model, a dancer, a performer. So take us back to thirteen-year-old Renee. Well, actually, take us back to a little bit before that and, <laughs> you know, growing up, um, in, in Canada, in the North, in the, you know, or it, it on farmlands. And because I see that in your, you know, your storytelling again, as well, the outdoors and that, that influence, and then into like, then you're a model. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The model transition was weird. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so the interest in storytelling definitely came from, you know, growing up in rural Canada, right? So everything is stories, especially back then. It's pre-internet. I mean, we didn't have a TV. Our TV was like this big, and it was basically to see if the school buses were closed or like if they were running or not because of the snow. Um, you know, it, it wasn't really used for much else. And it was always, you know, mom would be like, oh, are you bored? Well, there's tons of chores to do. And you're like, no, I'm good. I'm busy. Like... <laughs> I'm fine. I'm not bored. I swear I'm not bored. <laughs> and you go outside and you play in the trees and you give names to the trees and names to the bugs and everything else. But I mean, my grandfather on both sides actually were, are, are amazing storytellers. And, you know, my one grandfather would tell us stories about, um, you know, the, the, the night sky because he was an astronomer. And, you know, and we, he would tell us like all the Greek myths that went along with them. And then my grandmother was on my on my dad's side. She was also a painter and a like a sculptor. She worked with clay, and so there was this like really creative side. My mom is an illustrator. My dad was a writer, and and my dad actually uh, photographed around the world. So he traveled around the world in the 70s and photographed it. So he went through like New Zealand, lived in the outback of Australia, and then went up through the Philippines and then like through the Middle East, like through Asia, like hiked up to Everest, um, through Nepal, like through the Middle East and then up into Europe, right? And so growing up, seeing all these photographs and then hearing all these stories, I mean, it's just like saturated. And then all of a sudden, you know, video games become a thing, right? And they're in their infancy, but like the home console, right? We're not talking like Pac-Man and stuff, but you know, the PlayStation 1 comes out and that was the first gaming console that we got. And I was just like, oh, wow, look at these worlds, you know, these amazing illustrative worlds, like stuff that like, you know, I would read in books and then all of a sudden it's there on the screen and you can interact with it. Um, like really brought everything that like that fertile soil that had already been like, you know, planted with so many seeds. 
now had this ne like next level eruption of creativity of just like, oh, this is so cool. Like I never thought about creating it as um, as my own work yet. It was just like, you know, this fascination with these worlds. Although I have to say, um, I found recently when I was I was moving and I was going through like an old photo album, I think the concept of Photoshop for me was a thing when I was young. Because what I found was these these photographs and like, you know, we had these cameras, dad always had cameras around. And uh, I found like, you know, I'd accidentally printed five rolls of the same, like five copies of the same roll of film. And they were just like throwaway photos. I mean, I think I was six, you know, and it's like the cats in the living room and like whatever. And there's just like a whole bunch of copies. And I took scissors and I cut out the cats so that I would have like, you know, a whole bunch of cats in a single photo and I glued them on and like, you know, it was early scrapbooking basically, or like I cut out my one cat to be jumping into the fish tank, right? When he had originally been jumping off of, when he'd originally been jumping off the bunk bed. And then, you know, and I didn't even think about it. And then I was like, you know, in my thirties and I was like, oh, look at this. Like maybe I always did want to be doing this, but I didn't know. And, you know, it didn't really become a thing until I was a teenager. I think I love that because it, I mean, clearly, yeah, you were creating worlds uh, and, you know, and, and it's so fun to go back and connect the dots. You right. know, it's a lot easier to go back and connect the dots often. Totally. Um, and I, I didn't, I didn't realize that about your family and your father. And I mean, that it's, so it, it is again, connecting the dots, but like, it's so interesting to think about like what, what if your parents were, were different, you know, or yeah. like, or if your father hadn't experienced that and shared that with you and mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe it's like the sliding door thing. Uh, but it, it just, um, uh, that sounds it, it, to, to have him been doing that back in the seventies and the photographing, I mean, did that allow you to understand that that travel life was possible? Is that kind yeah, of where that I came mean, from? Yeah, I, I always I always wanted to to see it. I mean, there were definitely stories about it that scared me because dad has these photos also of like, you know, these big bird eating spiders that he would like provoke because he was in like the outback outback. And he would provoke them and they would chase him and he would have like photo these blurry photographs of these like, you know, these hell creatures. <laughs> You know, being from Canada, we, we don't like if I see a spider the size of my thumb, I'm like out. I burn the house down. I don't care. Like I'm out of I'm done. And, you know, and then to see these like these huge spiders. And of course, when you're a child, they look even bigger. Right. So these like these monsters that exist in other countries, these like huge snakes and stuff. Um, so some countries I was like, maybe I'll wait. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it's just like it was always just like okay so there's more than here like when can I get to see it how can I get to see it and it wasn't until I started shooting photography that I was ever able to afford to make that happen because I was just like this is part of the business plan you know I was just like I have to be able to see the world um and I don't care what I have to do to do it <laughs> and so how did you start how did you start traveling and making money to be able to um uh, was it getting jobs where you were traveling again like take us through through that beginning portion yeah so I mean photography started 11 years after modeling started um and I was just like I was burned out on it and I was like I don't I don't want to see another photo of my face ever again <laughs> or anyone else's for that matter um but you know then of course I I had a motorcycle crash and I got I got run over and then I had to do the whole like learning to walk again thing and you know I was that's when photography became full time for me the first time. And I was just like, oh, man, like, what are we going to do? <laughs> so traveling didn't start right away because I had to relearn walking again and then like get like healthy enough. And um, but in 2013, that's kind of when a lot of everything changed for me. Uh, I went to Las Vegas. I had no money. I had no business going. <laughs> but I was just I was going with Ben Von Wong um, and we were just like, we heard about this conference in Vegas called WPPI and this photographer that I knew um, from modeling. So he used to hire me for his video tutorials. Right. And so uh, he was like, yeah, I'm coming down. I'm going down to Vegas. Like, I know you're interested in photography and this is kind of like a thing for you now. I'm presenting. I can have an assistant. I can get you in on an assistant pass. And I was like, I will do anything to be there. I don't care what it is. And then I went down there and I realized 
oh my God, this is what this conference is. And look at all these people. And it just like, it completely opened doors that I didn't even know existed. And so like, I really have that conference to thank for like actually lighting the fire of being like, oh my God, this person's from Germany. And like, they're willing to like, let me come crash at their house for a little bit. Or like this person's from here. And then all of a sudden it becomes like, you know, you're napping on people's couches in different countries where you don't even, you can't understand the language. And that's, that's really like where it all started for me. Well, it's, it, it, it's like, I, I just thought about, you know, that's kind of early days of couch surfing and, 100%. you know, and, but it's when you're then, when you're like-minded in terms of it being photographers or, you know, other kinds of artists or what have you, there's just, it adds this connection um, yeah. that, I, I think again connects us all um, as you know people who are tuning in uh, because we feel sort of the same I don't know not not purpose per se but just passion I guess yeah yeah I mean it's it's just finding your tribe right you're finding your people you can disagree on a lot of other stuff but if something lights you up about photography then you're like okay that's our thread like that's our common thread these are a bunch of no go zones. <laughs> But like, this is our one that we can like, we can make this work for a week. Like I tell, I tell a lot of my friends, like I can handle almost any personality for seven days. <laughs> After seven days, it gets a little dicey, but, <laughs> um, you know, and like the, those early days of traveling, I mean, I was in my late, I was in my late twenties at the time and, you know, it just totally rewired my head in the way that I think. And I mean, it wasn't glamorous, <laughs> You know, people are just like, oh, how do you afford to travel all the time? Like, I don't spend money on anything else. Like, my my place that I'm living in is cheap, super cheap. My car is old. My gear is secondhand and used, you know, because I want to spend my money on that next airplane ticket to be able to get to where I'm going. And I don't care if I sleep on the floor. And now that I'm in my, I'm getting, I'm much closer to 40 than I am 30 now. I don't want to sleep on floors anymore, but like 20 year old me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> You're giving me flashbacks, Renee. Yeah, right. Sleeping on floors yeah. in, in Germany. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I slept on um, so many floors of like couches that were too short. And I was just yeah. like, I don't care. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> That's right. You and I are both tall. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I think it's an important point because a lot of people think, oh, to be a photographer or a professional photographer, it's about the gear or it's about having the latest and greatest. And just in life, too, um, you look at other people and, you know, you, you see what they're doing and you think often, especially when it comes to travel, like often that people have a ton of money or but it's priorities. Yeah, it's truly I mean, as as somebody who, you know, quit her job and traveled around the world for a year it was, that was my priority. Uh, and it was not all glamorous at all. It's hard. Yeah. It, what else in your life is, is your priority in addition to travel? I mean, these days sleep. <laughs> sleep is necessary. Oh man. Yeah. I can't do what 20 year old me was doing with the lack of sleep. And, and I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. I tried to plan for it to be like, okay, I've heard all my friends who are older than me when they hit their mid thirties and, and further that, you know, you start getting a little more, like you don't have the same rush of energy. And, and I was like, okay, well, I'm going to fight that off as long as I can. But man, jet lag now takes me like two weeks. <laughs> You know, like I've had a couple of concussions. I mean, I, I had a concussion right before my first creative live, um, which was kind of gnarly. And, you know, so like there's there's like a little bit of damage there now that I need to be a little bit more careful of. So sleep is ironically one of my big priorities now. <laughs> I think and that's awesome. Great. No, I mean, I think that from a from a brain level, like yeah. your brain needs that sleep and especially you know if you're it's so it, you mentioned the concussion before creative live and it wasn't yeah, I didn't tell I, you <laughs> I had no idea and it wasn't until we were talking last February that you told me that and I was like what yeah you yeah, can I hide the screen <laughs> you can hide that well my friend <laughs> that's why I kept pointing at the tv because that's the only screen I could see <laughs> it's so embarrassing <laughs> that I mean, it 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 shows a sort of um, 
resilience and I mean that talk to me about resilience. I mean, you were in a wheelchair, you had to learn how to walk again, and you were starting your bit, you know, a, a business at the time. A lot of people would say it's not possible in my state. You know, a lot of people would say, Creative Live, I got to reschedule. My brain is healing right now. Like, and that it, is the right answer. You should reschedule. <laughs> not necessarily. Your yeah. class is awesome. <laughs> If you have a brain injury, heal it. <laughs> um, but I mean, I just, I, 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 the first accident anyways, when I got run over, um, I mean, that took all my skills. I mean, all my previous skills, I went to school in the trades. I mean, I did locksmithing on and off for five years. I mean, like working with my hands and then modeling and then farm life and everything re like revolved around me being really strong and physically capable. And I liked it. And then all of a sudden I'm, I'm run over and I'm like, I can't do anything. I can't do any of the things that I wanted to do. And so I was just looking at it and I was just like, this is a hard reset. Like how many times in your life do you get the opportunity to completely reset your life? Little did I know 2020 would be happening and I would get a second chance. <laughs> but, um, you know, like the opportunity where like all of your previous habits, everything in your life is completely gone and you have no choice. Right. So I mean, granted, like if I had been run over, I would have had to reschedule Creative Life because <laughs> I had to reschedule everything else. But I mean, those things happen also because I had um, a lot of people in my life, a lot of friends and family uh, who stepped up, who were like, you know, do you need a ride somewhere? You know, um, like I would I would wake up in the morning and because I had to move in with my mom while I was healing because they had an elevator. My apartment had stairs. I couldn't get up and down the stairs. And so, um, I, you know, I was, I was staying with my mom and in the morning she would drop me off at physio on her way to work. And then I would do physio for eight hours a day. And then I would wait for her to be finished work. And then I would get picked up, go back home. And then I would just teach myself digital art. And I always tried to look at whatever was happening, um, as an opportunity. So whenever one door closes, another one opens most of the time most of the time. And there is like a whole bunch of asterisks in there because, <laughs> you know, sometimes it just sucks and you just have to get through it. And your resilience is just like knuckling down and just, you know, get through it. But I do think that people don't, you don't really know what you are capable of until you're in it. Right. You know, like if you have, like you don't know how capable you are if all of a sudden, I mean, this happened to a woman that I know and I love her very much. Um, she has three children and her husband passed away. And then all of a sudden her, her parents had to move in with her because they got sick. And you're just like, and I look at her and I'm just like, how do you do that? That is so strong. That is so like, there is so much strength in there. Right. And, you know, and she has a good support system and we, and we look after her, but, um, the fact that she can wake up every day and just like, all right, let's do this. Right. Like, that's so crazy to me because like, I look at that and I'm like, I couldn't, I can't imagine what that would be like. <laughs> um, but for her, she's just like, yeah, you wake up one day and that's your reality and you deal with it. And that's kind of what it was, was, you know, waking up every single day and just being like, okay, deal with it. Like whatever it is, you don't have to deal with 10 years from now. You don't have to deal with five years from now. You just have to deal with the next hour and then the next hour and then the next hour. Right. So it does make it difficult for like, what's your goals in five years? I mean, like, I don't know what my goals are in five years. I mean, I don't even know if I would have got into photography full time when I did, if it wasn't for that crash. Right. But yeah, I find if, if life is pushing on me really hard, I push harder. And sometimes that's to my detriment. <laughs> I mean, that's a great statement. When life is pushing at me, I push harder because it's, that's, that's, um, when it's easy to, uh, give up if you will, or uh, it, it's, it's the easier path to, to not see tragedy and, and, um, to, to feel like a victim and not see it as an opportunity. Right. Uh, well, and I mean, to be fair, like, and to, to like add the asterisks to that, like there's definitely days where, you know, I mean, even still with my leg, like it hurts to walk. And, you know, I look at my friends going out on these like amazing hikes in the Rockies and I'm like, I can't do that. And they're like, yes, you can. I'm like, I actually can't. And it, you know, like, I get sad about it, you know, and I let myself have those days where I'm just like, this sucks. 
you know, I don't, I don't try to pretend that those feelings don't exist because they do and they should be recognized. Um, but it also means that there, there's two ways to live life because life is going to keep moving forward. And this I got from my mom because my mom is, is like, she's tough as hell. <laughs> um, and she, she would always tell me when I was young and it, this stuck with me. She's like, life can either, you can either move with life or you can be dragged by life. And that's it. <laughs> She's like, life is moving whether you want to or not. And you can either get up and walk with it or it can pull you along and it can make you really miserable. And I've done the pull you along and make you really miserable. And I did some of that this year even because I was just like, eh. <laughs> but, you know, like it, people shouldn't feel bad about like, oh, I don't feel inspired all the time. That's fine. Nobody feels inspired all the time. Nobody's feeling good about everything all the time. Sometimes everything just sucks and you just kind of wallow in it for a little bit. But eventually you got to get back up. It, brilliant from your mother, by the way, um, <laughs> and especially to be able to learn that early on, because I think it's kind of when we're younger, we feel like we are going to live forever and we can do anything. And so I think that those first sort of things that butt up against you and, and challenge you often are the hardest but then with time you come to learn that like, it's okay. And I will get through it. And again, it's like, until you're in it, you don't know yeah. what you can are, are capable of doing. Yeah, totally. I mean, I have to thank growing up riding horses a lot for that attitude, because when you're little, a horse, even a pony is so much bigger than you are. And then when you get you get bucked off or you fall off or whatever, when you're, when you're riding horses, you have to get back on them, even if you're injured, because the way horse psychology is, if, if they buck you off and you stay off, that means that they know that they can win next time. So you have to, even if you're hurt, if you had the horse like step on you or whatever, like you have to get back on that horse just to like reassert the dominance. And so I kind of look at every single time that I get, you know, this, this meat suit is, is just not great. Like if I could trade it in and get another one that was more healthy, I would, <laughs> But every single time I get knocked down, I'm just like, okay, like life is this horse and I have to get back on it. <laughs> well, that's a great analogy as well. <laughs> I mean, and, and the, the physical um, nature of that and then, you know, being able to apply that. I, I listened to this awesome interview that you did um, about failure oh, yeah. um, and <laughs> it, it, y you talked about, you know, every single time that you want to quit is when somebody else did quit. Yeah. Can you take us to um, a time when you wanted to quit but didn't and, and how you did bring that resilience along? And I think it is important to, to remind us all that, yeah, you have to, it's not like we're not looking to, to not feel, it's about feeling and then pushing through it. Yeah, totally. I mean, uh, I mean, like a lot of people this year when COVID hit, that's a super good example of like, oh my God, 100% of my work that I spent the last two years building up to, right? So I took very little income for the last two years to build up to what this, to what 2020 was going to be, right? It, it was like lots of saving, not much like, well, not lots of saving, but spending money, uh, investing money, I guess is the right answer. And, you know, for it to be what 2020 was going to be. And I was like, really excited about it. I was like, finally, it's here. This is going to be the best year I've had in a long time. Like, this is like, totally great, you know, rebranding and stuff. And then lockdown happened. And I was, you know, at the time, I was living alone in a small basement apartment, because like I said, sometimes like, like I cut my expenses down real small. Um, and so I'm in lockdown, I'm in a basement suite with small windows <laughs> and not a lot of space. And I was just like, Oh my God, what am I going to do? You know? And there, there's, there's no way to push through it. Cause there's nowhere to go. Right. And I couldn't even like physically get outside. I would get out, I would get out and go into my car and go for a drive at night when all the roads were quiet, you know, and like just to get out of the house. And I was just like, man, like, is this one of those times where I should quit? Like, is that actually the the right decision? And quitting, the other thing that people always mistake is everyone feels like quitting is permanent, right? And being creative, you never really quit being creative. You can take a break. You can take a break for 10 years, 20 years even, right? But, um, you know, if you ever decide to go back to it, you didn't quit. You just took a break. <laughs> 
Um, but I was like, yeah, is this going to be one of those years where like, you know, this return on investment just like didn't work. And I was like, you know what, for three months, I was like, we're not doing anything. And I just like closed my laptop and I read books. Like, I didn't try to make any income. I didn't try to think outside the box of like, how can I rebrand myself? How can I better myself? I was like, nope, I <laughs> closed the laptop. Again, this is another opportunity from life. I was like, probably this is never going to happen again where there is actually nothing I can do except like feed my brain in all the ways that I've been wanting to. So I moved into a new place, nicer space, bigger windows. <laughs> Cause I was like, if this lockdown's happening for a while, I need to be somewhere better. So, and then I pulled all my books out of storage and, and I just started with like book one <laughs> and I just started reading and reading and reading. And I'd like, I would check my email like once every two weeks. I was like, nobody's emailing me, but just to make sure. <laughs> Um, and you know, and then coming out the other side of it, right. You know, went back to Newfoundland for a little while and, you know, there we were able to run like a few small workshops and like little things of like, okay, so we're like, we're back sort of into it, but now back in Alberta and the lockdowns are back here. So they're just like, kind of like ebbing and flowing with it. But, you know, realizing that, you know, there has to be this, like this relaxation on how permanent quitting is, right? Like there's such a negative, you know, and I realize I am, I perpetuate that and that, you know, every single time I want to quit is when someone else does. And I'm like, as if that's like a check mark in my favor when it's like against someone else, but it isn't, it's people doing the right things for themselves. Um, and so if the right thing for yourself, like I have no dependence, I have a cat that eats like, you know, not much food every day. My dependent is very small and fuzzy and cheap to feed. But if I had three kids, or, you know, even like dependent parents, right? It would be a completely different conversation. So like, yeah, I want to quit sometimes. Some years I want to quit a lot. <laughs> and then I just don't because I try to figure out like, okay, how do, how can I make this work within the, the, the confines of society and money and everything else in my life right now? And so, yeah, this year is a total wild card though. <laughs> I've had some students be like, what do you recommend for first starting out your business? So I was like, don't start this year. <laughs> Next year. <laughs> Let's hope. Crossing fingers. <laughs> oh my God. So cross. So cross. <laughs> um, there's so many, so many beautiful things in, in what you just talked about, Renee. And I think just echoing that point of what is it like quitting that is, is such a scary word and seems permanent and what have you. Um, but if you can reframe that as just reframing yeah. what you're spending your time on, what you're prioritizing, uh, the concept of pivoting, um, with whatever is again, not being dragged alone by life, but choosing living at choice. Yeah. And as then, much as you can anyways, <laughs> as much as you can, but for yeah. yourself, yeah. Um, because once again, you can look at, you can look at other people and, and they've, the, and wonder, you know, and compare yourself and all of that. Uh, but again, if you can come back around and stay true to your own path and it, that's all that you have really, and you don't know um, what's going on with other people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, the worst thing you can do to yourself is like compare yourself to somebody else. Like, man, I mean, even I'm guilty of it sometimes. We all you know, are. I look at, I look at some girl at like online. I'm like, Oh my God, her abs are so awesome. As I'm like elbows deep in a bag of Doritos. Like, <laughs> like, you know, I'm like, Oh my God, look at like, you know, she works out so much. And I'm just like, I want that, but it's, I obviously don't want it that much. I obviously want like my bag of chips more. <laughs> and on that particular day, that's okay. And it's I'm fine when, with it. Yeah. Again, like it's that, I think it's also, that's, it's such an important point to remind yourself that if you wanted something really badly, you, you would be prioritizing it. And yeah. so understanding that is sort of this acceptance of, again, it's, it's priorities. Yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of things that can go into, you know, how, how you feel about your priorities. And sometimes that can be as simple as like, you know, keeping track of what did you eat this week? How much sleep did you get this week? Right. You know, could this be impacting why you feel a certain way about your life? <laughs> 
um, you know, there, there's like a lot of little things that you can kind of fine tune that, you know, chemically make a big difference in your body and how you react to life and life happening to you. Absolutely. What are, so we talked about sleep. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other things that you've learned for yourself? Um, are those extra sort of healing self-care, um, just, you know, things that keep us sane. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I mean, this is going to sound ridiculous, but I took up coloring books. (laughs) Not ridiculous. Um, because I wanted to learn more about color harmony and I didn't understand. I mean, I'm not, I'm not the Kate Woodman's of the world, right. Where she like, she understands color so well and I, I'm not her and color comes hard to me. It's not easy. And so I was like, okay, well, how can I teach myself color in a way that makes sense to me? And I was like, I'm just buying some coloring books and a bunch of like pencil crayons. Although I think Americans call them colored pencils. They'll forever be like a, a, a fighting ground. They're pencil crayons. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and then I just got some colored markers and, and I just, you know, every week or two or whatever, I just sit down and I open up a coloring book and I just color it, whatever I'm feeling. And then I try to analyze it later and be like, okay, why do these colors work for me? Why do they don't, if I could change them, what would I change? And that's evolved into, um, doing it digitally. So I have a, the, a Wacom that I can draw on the screen. And I just like take a picture with the, of the coloring book with my phone and then just like send it to myself. And then I color it digitally. And then I'm like, okay, if I could change, what would I change? And then, you know, then I can do it on the fly. And it's just like this weird evolution of like, you know, it relaxes my brain because it has nothing to do with work. I'm not posting this. This isn't going anywhere. This is literally just like me and mine, you know, sitting in front of the TV, listening to Daredevil or Punisher or whatever's going on. <laughs> And, you know, just like relaxing, but still feeling like I'm being creative. I think those are the exercises that, again, sometimes we don't allow ourselves to do. Mm -hmm. uh, But you can totally see how that is going to play into the the composite work, your art, you know, all of that um, in in a way that just felt natural to you. and with the side of uh, side benefit of it's totally calming um, and and that, you know, aids everything else. Uh, so I, I yeah, love it's that. almost meditative. It's almost meditative. It yeah. No, it is. It's an act yeah. of meditation. Yeah. Um, I want to go into a little bit into your your style. And, you know, we were talking about the 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 boldness of the weather that you're drawn to and, you know, and, and so coming back around to sort of the, I don't know, the, the, the dark, the stormy, um, in your work. Um, I, I was just, I was looking through your Instagram and there was a post that said, um, it's been a while since I dipped my toes into horror, uh, but I cut my teeth in that industry and it feels good to wade in dark places again. So tell us about, um, horror, uh, how you, what, what industry that was or, or what the darkness, um, does for your creativity. Uh, I just want to double check. Am I frozen? Oh, I am seeing that now. (laughs) Adam Bauer, are we, um, that's my director. Are we, uh, I think you are looking frozen to me. So everybody, I'm just going to Give some shout outs as, oh, there, we go. Um, oh yeah. there you are. Okay. You can do a shout out though, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, shout outs going back to uh, Austria to, um, I mean, so many, Houston, Ireland, uh, Germany, all these things, all of them, all the places. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Um, so coming back around to, um, I was, I had said, um, yeah. y- yes, yes. Yeah. So I have this, this funny thing where I, so when I was younger, I didn't mind watching horror. Like I was never like, I loved horror, but I didn't, I didn't mind watching it. I, you know, part of me kind of enjoyed the creativity, but, uh, as I get older now, I don't, I don't really like watching horror at all, but I love making it and I don't know why. <laughs> Um, and it's not because I, I value like violence because I don't, you know, like I, I'm, 
very soft that way. <laughs> but there's something about it that I have always enjoyed. And I mean, the horror industry itself, I mean, the fans of horror are some of the best fans I've ever met. You know, like you, you go into fan culture and, you know, it, it can be really toxic, right? You know, like, I think it's so funny. We have we have Marvel movies out right now and they're everything that I ever want. Even bad Marvel movies are amazing and like DC movies, like even the worst of them are so much better than what I ever could have hoped for when I was young, right? And so every single time one of these movies comes out, like my inner teenager is so excited. But the fan culture around it is so toxic. But fan culture around horror, for whatever reason, my experience with it has been amazing. Like, they're super welcoming. They're super open. And they just love, like, it can be campy. It can be, like, whatever. And they just love it. You know, they love it for exactly what it is. And I think it was, for me anyways, a really great industry to, to cut my teeth in because they were so welcoming, right? Like, I don't know if I would have pushed as hard as I did if I had had the reaction that I see some of my other friends who do fan work get, you know, of like, oh, well, that person doesn't fit that role because of A, B, C, D, and E, right? And it's just like weird to see the comments, but in horror, they're just like, oh, man, that's so great. Like, it can be cheesy VFX artists, like VFX art. And they're just like, oh, yeah, this is amazing. Um, and so I just kind of always liked, I appreciated the fan culture around it even more so than the work, than the work itself. Um, and admittedly, for whatever reason, like some of my horror artwork, the scarier stuff, like the girl with the red riding hood girl with the, the bloody dress and stuff. I mean, I made that like almost 10 years ago now. And it's still like, I sell more, I sell prints of that more than almost anything else. And I, I always think it's funny and interesting. And I, I often ask people when they buy the prints, like, what do you see in that? Like, what story do you see? You know, and that's, that's actually the image that changed it for me was instead of me trying to tell a story, I would try to tell the start of a story and then get the, the person who's buying the print to fill me in with their version of it because everyone sees everything through their own filters and their own life experiences, right? And that's how you can watch two people talk about the same thing and get two completely different opinions is because their filters are completely different. And so with storytelling, with the images, even with the horror stuff, it's so diverse and I think it's really fun. I really enjoy that. I'm kind of long-winded. <laughs> no, no, it's, um, I love what you just said about you're just starting the story and recognizing that the interpretation of it, y you can't control. Uh, and so it's this, you know, this, this letting go of that. Is there some freedom artistically when you approach it that way versus like I have to create this thing that everybody's gonna understand and know and love or you know just is there a freedom in that I think I think so I mean there's only one image that I've made where I really put a story to it that I attached to it and it was um the girl jumping off the building with the little tiny wings um and that is you know, one of the few images that's gone like absolutely everywhere, uh, at least early on anyways. And I think I've always been chasing that since because it, it's such a universal truth of, you know, we all feel like we've jumped off the the ledge of something at some point in, in our lives, in our career, where, whether it's changing your job or moving or asking someone out or like filing for divorce. It all feels like jumping off of a bridge or like, you know, something really tall where you're just like, you know, the butterflies in your stomach and everything kind of goes crazy. Um, I think that's the only image I've ever made where there's like a universal language to it. Um, I do think that it's a lot more free when I can just like guide people to the door and then let them fill in the rest because I want people to get personally attached to the work. I want them to write their own story because I think everyone has an interesting story to tell. I, I just think it's a beautiful way to to flip your mindset about what you're creating. And <laughs> if if no one was to see what you were creating, would you create it differently? No, I mean, I, I, I have this conversation with myself all the time. I mean, and I've had people ask this, if no one ever saw your work, would you still create? I create tons of work that nobody sees all the time. I mean, more work. I make more work that nobody sees than what people do see, uh, even outside of, of client work. I mean, 95% of my client work 
doesn't exist anywhere and nobody can see it. Um, so I'm okay with that because I, I create so that the people who I'm creating it for, even if it's myself can in, can enjoy it. It isn't, doesn't have to be like, you know, my name super attached to it. That's why, you know, when I see people making illustrations or tattoos of my work, I'm just like, yeah, this is great. Awesome. You know, like I did some, some girl with a, with a mermaid being tied up and those went everywhere. And there were so many paintings and illustrations and tattoos. And, you know, some, like some people were like, Oh, don't you think that's like weird? And shouldn't they ask you? And I'm like, no, man, this is, this is great. Like if they're not selling it for a hundred million dollars, like I don't care. <laughs> what they're doing with it. I love that I was able to put something out in the world that other people were inspired to make something of. And that is very, very cool. Like, I think that's one of the few ways that I can actually do good in this world through art, because I do think art in general is a very selfish experience, right? You know, there's people like, Oh, you know, without art, where would Netflix be? Absolutely correct. You know, every single show on Netflix exists because of a committee though, but it does involve a bunch of creative people. So yeah, I, I get it, but I do think art, art is a selfish experience. And if the one way that you can give back is that by fueling up other people's creativity so that they can make more stuff, then that's a good thing. Well, I think it's a compliment and an honor, you know, (laughs) people are, are, are making tattoos, you know, of your work. I mean, that's, that's, (laughs) that's a huge, a huge compliment. And, um, I want to go a little bit more into the, the selfishness, um, Mm -hmm. of is, do you believe selfish is a bad thing? That word? Yes and no. Yes and no. Um, I think that there is nothing wrong with being selfish, uh, especially when it comes to being creative. Like why not? It's your creative expression you can own that and you can make that about you. It doesn't have to be for like a greater cause of anything beyond you just wanted to make it because it makes you feel nice. Um, but I think there's this, this like weird ego that can get attached that kind of turns me off of a lot of, uh, creative pursuits where, you know, the work validates who the person is. Right. You know, and then, like this is this weird, you know, oh, well, I'm important because of A, B, C, D, and E. And it's just like, no, man, you're just, you're just a person. You're making cool stuff and and people like it and just like, let it be that. Like there doesn't, you know, nothing highlighted to me more the lack of importance, quote unquote, of arts. And this is going to get me much hate mail. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Then, then the pandemic, right? Like, you know, like creative pursuits are not the things like on the, the, the hierarchy of needs. We're right up here at self-actualization. And the fact that we live in a society where so many of us have the time at the end of the day to pursue self-actualization is amazing. And it's one things but when society starts to break down and we are at this base level again. Like that, I think is a really good reset to remind people that like, this is self-actualization. This is a want. It is, you know, psychology, like psychologically and spiritually a need. Absolutely. But that's why it's at the top. Like if we're not looking after these things, then we can't look after the rest of it. And so I think that if, if we aren't contributing to like that base level, like then just drop the ego, like just stop. <laughs> and that's, that's where the selfishness thing starts to like, irk me and I start to just like stop interacting with artists and stuff for a while where I'm just like okay guys like relax like we are we are a want (laughs) yeah I I mean very important points in there that yeah something like this year reminds us of you know what the foundational level of things that we all need to to survive as humans um it, it also to your point of you taking the time to read and reset and sleep and all of that, you know, it does also remind us that, you know, again, it's our choice to go to, to spend time on what we spend time on. Yeah, um, again, absolutely. once those foundational things yeah. are, are needed, but I, I think what I'm hearing is that it, it, with regard to selfishness or what have you, like, it's all about what the intention is 100%. perhaps behind, behind that. 
Yes. And, and so that's kind of the differentiation. Um, yes. Because I used to think that selfishness was a bad thing until I realized that sometimes it was just me prioritizing me or what I needed in, you know, in that time or moment. Um, and not necessarily um, at odds with selflessness, I guess. A hundred percent. Yeah. They're, they're not mutually, ex- they're not, they're not, you can't have one and the other. You can have both because I mean, at some point you do have to look after yourself because if you don't look after yourself, you you can't help others. And if we live in a society, I mean, I live in, in Canada and, and, you know, we are a slightly more socialist country. And I, I like that. I like that. I know that the things that I do, for example, paying taxes, um, you know, helps my friend's kids go to school. I don't have kids. I don't want to have kids, but I like that I can contribute to the education of other kids. I like that I can contribute to, um, you know, like trying to solve homelessness or, or water shortage problems or whatever. I like that, like my small, you know, percentage of whatever it is that can contribute helps the society more. And if another way that I can do that is by being creative and inspiring others, then that's bonus points. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's the important point being, you know, they are not mutually exclusive. 100%. Uh, and, and, uh, I love Canada. <laughs> I love Canadians. <laughs> Our winters are brutal, man. <laughs> true. That's true. That's true. Um, I, I, I just want to maybe end on, um, because you, you know, you do have, we're talking about your work, um, there's work you do for yourself, but again, this like level of giving back of helping others, that's clearly very important to you. Um, and, and so coming back around to, you're a teacher, you're an educator, you're a speaker, you're a guide for so many people that are tuning in right now and comments coming in on Facebook about, um, how much people have learned from you and all of that. And so really what is it about, <laughs> what is it about, uh, teaching that, does maybe just a little bit further teaching that that really um, inspires you when you see what people are creating based on I guess you know based on your your teaching. What is I it about mean, you that other you see in other people that brings that back to you? I mean, well, when I first got into compositing, there was no creative live. There was no flern. There was no anything. There was this this little weird website, um, and I think Calvin Hollywood had a digital painting thing online, like a, a Toots Plus or something. But it was all like digital painting, and I remember how hard it was to pull information to try to figure out how to use these programs in a way to get what was in my head out onto the screen. And I always wonder what it would have been like if it had been easier, right? And so I look at, at like my younger self and I try to teach in a way that, you know, my younger self appreciates, which means I'm not for everyone, but no, no teacher is, but I do love getting these emails, you know, like a, a six months or a year or two later after someone has either bought a tutorial or taken a course or whatever. And they're just like, Hey man, like, I just wanted to write you to let you know that, you know, I, I took your course and it changed everything for me. And, you know, I'm now a digital matte painter in a, in a film studio and I love my life. And I'm just like, that is awesome. You know, and like, you know, and they're, they say that, like, you know, that wouldn't have happened without some little tiny thing. And that feels like one of the few things that I can do in this career that really, really matters because I, I don't create, I don't document life. Right. So photographing, people who are no longer around or events that have happened in the past, like that stuff matters because it's memory, but I make fake stuff. I make stuff that isn't real. Um, and, and so, you know, I've, I've always been conflicted with that. I've always had a hard time squaring that away of like, how do I make something? How do I put, do good in the world other than like, Oh, it's a pretty picture, double tap scroll, right. In being able to teach and seeing that these little tiny ripple effects, like I just like, throwing a rock in a pond and, and these little tiny ripples go out and, you know, somebody's 15 year old kid discovers photography for the first time and they, they watch a course and it changes everything for them. And all of a sudden their life goes from, from this direction to this direction. Um, that feels really good. (laughs) Um, I mean, when I checked the creative live website last year, how many downloads my course had, I was blown away. I couldn't believe how many students there were. And I was just like, like people, (laughs) 
people are watching this, you know, like that, that, that's crazy to me because there's, there's so many people out there to learn from. And the fact that people are choosing, you know, my name amongst the list of, of literal tens of thousands that they could learn from is, is really, I don't, it's very flattering. I mean, I get all like weird and fuzzy inside about it. My hands feel all tingly. (laughs) Um, But yeah, it just, it just feels good that teaching is the one way that I can make someone's life better. It's beautiful. And again, it's, it's, (laughs) it's an honor, you know, just like people getting tattoos of, of your work. (laughs) And so I would say going back to, um, I mean, the, that, that's important too, you know, mm-hmm. that creating things that are not reality, you know, it's obviously it's a different thing than wedding photography, um, totally. but it, it, it's, it does serve a purpose and a value um, in many ways. And so it's <laughs> to have created a life um, where you're able to do both of those um, it is, it's just a, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And I think that's why people are drawn to, to learn from you. Um, is you know not yeah it's not just <laughs> the the work itself but the the way you approach it and and that it's coming from the heart uh truly is you're making me feel all warm and fuzzy inside Good. Like a cat. <laughs> Good. <laughs> well renee it's been such a pleasure i always love talking to you um and i want to give another shout out to lisa carney um who the three of us have sat around talking together as well yeah. and lisa said i love this conversation i feel like we're sitting around having a life chat just missing the wine i know i know lisa. i got i got tea here we can it's cold but we can have yeah. we can share cold yeah. tea and cheers water. yeah <laughs> I, got, I got water cheers Uh, Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And Renee, tell everybody, if they're not following you already, um, can join the uh, hundreds of thousands of people, all the peoples all over the world um, (laughs) who do follow you, whether that's for your your artwork itself or education. So where can people connect with you? Uh, Yeah, so, I mean, my website, uh, FYI, everyone, it used to be ReneeRobinPhotography.com. Unfortunately, uh, people can be jerks, so it's now... Super nice and short. It's ReneeRobin.com uh, is my website, so it's a lot easier to remember. Instagram is at ReneeRobinPhotography. Uh, Twitter, at ReneeRobinPhoto. I actually started a Twitch channel. I haven't done anything with it yet, but I don't know what to do with it. I'm too old for Twitch, but I'm going to try. <laughs> um, if you search ReneeRobinPhoto, I think is on there is what it is, or Renee Robin, And then YouTube, of course, is uh, Renee Robin as well, so... It's around there. If you search one of the combination of Renee Robin or Renee Robin photography, it'll pop up. I'm on most channels. So yeah. And I'm sure I really try to be really approachable. So if you send me a message, um, I do try to respond to as many people as I can. So. Okay. Well, I'm super excited about Twitch and cause you, I mean, that combines like all of that again, like another thing <laughs> that looking back, it combines like all the aspects uh, of you and um, I know what you mean as well. Like, but but we're not too old for Twitch. There's, <laughs> there's, there's so it may you know it may have started in one way, but there's so much there, and I haven't really um, dipped my toe into it either. But um, but that's exciting. That's yeah, exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. super nervous about it um, because I mean, like, do people just really want to watch me mask for hours? Because that's what it's gonna be. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm just gonna be sitting there and being like. And Lisa Carney's gonna watch and she'll be like, You're doing this the slow way. I'm like, it's the way that I know how. <laughs> it's but again, that's that's learning, you know. That's totally. learning. Yeah. Um, it's also I'm just reading. levels. It's like yeah. I enjoy it. <laughs> um, another another comment, um, Jim Mockford saying, come visit the Wacom Experience Center on Twitch. You're not too old for Twitch, and Wacom would love to keep you on Twitch <laughs> to link that up with you. So fun. there you go. Yeah, everyone's <laughs> coming in. Everyone's coming in, editing Hangouts on Twitch. So just do it. Just start. <laughs> <laughs> well, follow the channel, and I will yeah. I will get over my fear eventually, and, and then I will I will do a thing. So, but you got to be there. So you have to sign up for the Twitch thing first and then, then we'll just like hang out and you can listen to my crappy metal and <laughs> I love it. my terrible I choice love in it. music. <laughs> <laughs> or not. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, you can also hit mute. <laughs> no, I meant or not in that it's not terrible to many people. Um, <laughs> Fair. Some of it's pretty cheesy. It's like extra cheese ball. <laughs> Oh, Renee, thank you so much uh, for being on um, Creative Live, for being on our show. And I just um, want to wish you all the best. And I want to, again, remind everybody, if you're not already following Renee, please do. All of those links will be in the show notes. Um, and it's just been a pleasure to have you on. Everybody, you can hear all of the episodes of We Are Photographers, over 100 episodes, going to creativelive.com slash podcast or subscribe wherever it is that you listen to your podcasts as well. Just search Creative Live, search We Are Photographers. Uh, we do love those reviews. We'd love to hear um, what you think and also who else you want to have on the show. So give us, a, give us a shout out and a message and thank you so much. We'll see you all next time. Thank you again, Renee Robin. Bye, thanks for having me. I miss your face. I miss I all miss your faces. Face. <laughs>